Vinod, yes. first of all, thank you so much for the opportunity to have a conversation with you. Before we go dive deep into DeepMind and what you are doing, if we can uh, know how did you get into Google and how did you think uh, of a career in AI, if you can tell us. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that obviously goes far back. Um, I think for me, there are a couple of things I was always fascinated by as I was growing up. One of them was mathematics. One of them was biology. And I think uh, AI and machine learning sort of intersect between those because a lot of AI nowadays is deep learning, which is inspired by neural networks. There are lots of other optimization techniques inspired by other biological processes. And it's just mathematics all around. So for me, as soon as I kind of found out about that, I was already fascinated and fascinated by the process of cognition, the human brain, understanding that better. And, you know, I know that the AI that we have today, it's not like the human brain in very many ways. Um, but I think there are some similarities and analogies we tend to follow that took us from where we were before as a field to where we are now. Uh, so from my point of view, it's still sort of full of synergies. And we also have, uh, you know, people who are neuroscientists in training at our office who also help us come up with some ideas. So uh, it's just a very, very rich field. And thinking about intelligence, thinking, thinking about thinking, um, it's very, very inspiring because it tells us a lot, not just about how to build AI, which is obviously what we're doing, but it tells us more about ourselves because the more we understand the concept of intelligence and what makes a system be intelligent, um, we inadvertently learn more about what it means to be human. Like even if we solve the problem of intelligence in a different way, um, by seeing what works, what doesn't, and why, how information is encoded, how memories are represented, and all these kinds of things, it just brings a lot of interesting insights. Amazing. Now that we know how your career shaped up, let's know about how you came into the world of chess. How did chess come into your life? Yeah, well, chess came into my life, I guess, you know, going all the way back through my grandfather, who really liked to play. Uh, so I used to play with him as a kid for a while. Then at some point, not too early, but in elementary school, um, I got into a local chess club, uh, played a bit there, had a coach for a brief period of time, uh, and just sort of fell in love with the game. Uh, and then later on at university, I continued playing a bit. It was never my big focus. It was something I would do in my, in my free time. And I would obviously follow, follow the professional players and the, their games and tournaments. And uh, obviously, I was focusing on other things. Um, but chess is something I play pretty much every day. And uh, it's still you know, one of my favorite things. So I'm very, very happy to be here. So how did that happen, that uh, interstellar thing, when chess met your profession and AI? if you can tell us, and when did you think that this will be the next step forward? I mean, chess met AI way back. Yes. Um, obviously, the very early days of computer science, not AI, and, and the very early days of computer science were, in some sense, also the very early days of AI, because the pioneers of our field were really interested in the same kinds of questions that we are interested in today, mm -hmm. just they didn't have the tools to solve them in the way in which we can you know, try to solve them right now. Um, but they did think about this, and uh, one of the very first things they tried to do was create a chess-playing intelligent machine. Um, and they had some very early attempts, and there were programs that could make some moves. Obviously, this doesn't compare to the chess engines of today or the chess engines even of decades ago. Uh, but it was very slow progress, and each time there would be new insights that would help shape the field. Um, for a long time, it was actually felt that if we were to solve chess, uh, we would solve AI. I think nowadays we know that AI and intelligence and everything else is bigger than chess. Chess is a limited game at the end of the day, um, but it's so rich. And you know, we see here at the World Championship um, just how how compelling these games are, how deep the positions are, and the ideas. So still, it inspires the field in different kinds of ways. But we understand that you know we need to uh, you know think about. Uh, language and thinking in language and uh, multimodality and computer vision and other things. So step-by-step uh, re -step reasoning and planning ahead and thinking about consequences of actions. This is obviously part of what it means to be intelligent, uh, but it's a particular aspect. And this is something that chess has helped us develop over the years, uh, all the way through uh, from the early chess engines and kind of rule-guided expert systems to systems like AlphaZero, LeoZero and beyond, right? That utilize uh, deep learning, neural networks, reinforcement learning, and so on to self-teach themselves and advance and improve. If you want to give us a background of what your role is and how is uh, AlphaZero or DeepMind 
going to help younger players and what is uh, what is its contrib AI's contribution and how can young players or even experienced players use it to better themselves or make themselves better if you can share um, I mean I think all chess engines so when it comes to Alpha Zero I guess the Alpha Zero which is out there is a sort of a, an open source version of Alpha Zero all chess engines are obviously immensely useful for young people as they train up um, because, I mean, it's nice if you have a partner to play with, right? But if you don't have a partner, you can play against an engine. You can input any kind of a position and immediately see the lines and test your ideas. Now, you know, one can argue that doing this too much is not good either because you can get a bit lazy because you just get the answers. So probably the right way of going about it is giving it a proper go, thinking for a while, trying to solve positions, and then obviously double-checking with the engines. But at the same time, I would say it's important not to see them only as... A, the verification tools, right, that yeah. confirm whether a certain line works, give their plus zero 37 in the end or something like that, mm -hmm. but rather as idea generators, because after you've had an engine run for a while in a complex position, you get a number of moves usually that may be considered. And if there is a small difference in eval, usually it doesn't matter that much. So it's more about then a human gut feeling and intuition and evaluation of that position, and you see is something viable or if there is a reputation. So that can help you in the opening stage, especially as you think about the types of structures you want to go for, the types of opening ideas you want to explore. But it can obviously help throughout the game and in end game studies and different kinds of positions. And when it comes to Alpha Zero in particular, it obviously brought a particular style of play of chess. Um, I mean, I've not looked all that much at Hila games, and I'm presuming it, it's replicating the same kind of style. Um, and that complements maybe the style of other engines like Stockfish, I guess, well. And in an ideal case, and I think this is what many professionals do, because different engines will see things slightly differently, they're all obviously very strong, it pays off to just consult multiple engines and see what they all think and then, you know, reason on top of that and, and integrate that information. So I, I see them as very useful tools, but there are obviously very many ways in which they can be used. And uh, I know there are projects out there and hopefully there will be many more projects out there that take these initially developed engines and don't just use them as engines to play against, but then build on top of them to do things like personalized training and recommendations, for example. Because if you can analyze your games, you can obviously find where you made mistakes, but then you can characterize those mistakes, right? You can, and this is also where machine learning can again come in, but you can find patterns in the mistakes you make, and then you can you know, think about tailoring a program that would help you overcome the particular kinds of mistakes that you're likely to make at this point in time, because that may, may identify maybe some concepts you're not handling, handling ideally, right? Or, or it's just if some particular types of structures or positions that we need more training on. So I think that if we think about how AI can play an important role in chess and chess education, I think there is a great potential there in terms of how to take a person from, you know, all the way from the amateur level Obviously, maybe it's not so necessary very early on because everyone needs to learn the same basics. Mm -hmm. But then as you keep improving and you hit certain levels, um, it's potentially useful if you can be more sort of surgical, as they would say, in identifying the types of issues you want to work on. As we are in the World Championship, where it's not only a game between two players, it's a game between two nations. Yes. Right? And uh, it's, a, it's a, in the larger picture, there's a, like, uh, in, in current day, whoever has the better data is on top of the other people, right? So do you think even AI and engines are also in some way that the, the nation or the players who have the better engines has an advantage? Do you think so? Or do you think this gives an advantage in any ways or no? Um, I mean, I'm not, you know, 100% on the actual resources people use and how they use them. Uh, I know that, you know, there were mentions uh, I think it was even in the Carlson Caruana match a couple of yes. years ago yes. about uh, a supercomputer crunching yes. through some, yes. some ending positions and so on. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, you can spend a lot of time preparing for the, for the openings, for particular ideas, particular lines, and prepare them deeply. Um, but you see that you're at the board, you're playing a game, and uh, surprises go both ways, and you still have to play the, play the player and play the position. So you, you don't win a World Chess Championship match by having an engine at home. You win by being a better player, I would think. Um, anything can bring some kind of an advantage. 
But, you know, I think we have a very exciting match ahead and I would like to think that the best player would win. Absolutely. Well said. And finally, before uh, we conclude the conversation, we want to know that there's a very serious problem in chess yes. right now. It's cheating, uh, like online chess. So is there a way that AI uh, or maybe uh, Gemini can solve it? Uh, like if there can be no cheating, there's no way people can cheat. Um, I mean, I don't think Gemini can to start with. When it comes to AI, I mean, it's something I've thought about. Uh, I think the answer is it can't solve it. It can probably help with it. Okay. Um, and I'm obviously aware of the problem because it's been a, a big part of the conversation recently. Uh, it's actually hard to know the scale of the problem um, for that very reason because, I mean, I know that these chess platforms like chess.com and so on, uh, they do have some... Um, some solutions behind the scenes that they use to screen for, for, for this kind yes. of behavior. I'm obviously not personally sure what the solutions are, how good they are. I mean, they would know these things. Uh, or whether they use AI already for this. Mm -hmm. But I guess one, one problem at the end of the day is that um, when you want to evaluate how well your tool works, you need to know the truth to evaluate against and then you know how many false positives, negatives you may have if you, you know, set the thresholds in a certain way. Mm -hmm. So unless you have some data, and same goes for machine learning, machine learning is learning from data, it's not magic. So unless you have actual data of people having cheated, so you know that for sure, and people not having cheated, you know that for sure. And this at scale for various ways in which people can do that, and there are very many ways in which people can do that. Uh, and it will be very different for each time control, for each setup, uh, it probably looks different in 3.2, uh, 3.0, 3 5.0, rapid, uh, I know there's also cheating over the board, right, uh, yes. with uh, restroom breaks and whatnot, right? But in every, in every single scenario, it would look very different. So it's, what I'm trying to say is it's a very hard problem. Mm -hmm. I would still imagine that because machine learning excels at finding patterns in data, mm -hmm. and obviously when you have the ground truth, you can just train against that ground truth. Otherwise, what, there are other things you can do. You can find suspicious activities. You can find outliers in the data. But the fact that those things are outliers, it doesn't imply that there is cheating going on. Mm. It just means that this is abnormal in some way. Mm -hmm. But as we know from statistics, abnormal things happen all the time, right? So then you, you know, look at trends over time, try to infirm whether there are too many abnormalities, like it's just very suspicious. But at the end of the day, it's not proof, it's evidence towards, right? Even if you find that. So it's a very human judgment call in the end that people have to make. I mean, does this really constitute solid evidence or not? Um, so I think, yeah, if one were to develop tools like that, and as I was saying, they would be hard to build, it's really possible to have helpful tools that help human, you know, experts identify whether it's reasonable to assess something as highly likely uh, cheating or not. Um, but I don't see it as a fully automatable process at all. I don't think this can solve the problem. Um, and also, you know, there are people who cheat very obvious and there are people who are very smart about it. So usually when people talk about the crisis when it comes to cheating in chess, they talk about the very smart cheaters. And that's obviously a very hard problem. It's far easier to catch someone if they're spending like flat 10 seconds per move, whether the move is, you know, easy or hard and then play engine moves all the time. I mean, that's, that's clear. You don't even need AI. I mean, if you've played Blitz online and you've played against players like that, you yes. know, right? Um, but this is not what the actual problem is. So then, um, yeah, I mean, I'm sure there will be solutions. But again, as I was saying, AI can maybe be a part of the solution. I don't see it as the whole solution. Okay. So, I'm really sorry, I forgot to ask you one last question. Sure, yeah. yeah. Uh, you uh, you were surprised just a few moments ago by uh, <laughs> putting in a challenge. How was that? If you can just share with us. I mean, it was it was uh, an amazing and a humbling experience. Obviously, it's not every day you get to you know play against players of that caliber yes. uh, with a very um, obvious outcome in the end as well. But I, I truly enjoyed it. So uh, yeah, this is just a, a very special event here. So it's. Uh, we're all very, very delighted to be here. Amazing. Thank you so much and uh, for your time and thank you so much for what you are doing. We are already looking forward to how Google DeepMind AlphaZero is going to help us yeah. uh, help grow chess. And we are already looking forward to chess being reinvented every day. So thank you so much for your contribution and your time. Thank you very much. Thank you.